Let's pray. Father, thank you for this just wonderfully clear explanation of the gospel. And now as we talk about it, Father, may you unpack your word to us. Uh, give us understanding, we pray. Transform our minds and help us to see how we ought to be living to glorify your name. Amen. Well, at, at the age of 48, Susan Boyle had only ever sung in her local parish. As an unmarried lady, she lived a quiet life looking after her mother and her cat. But she'd always dreamed of being a famous singer. Then after getting a break on Britain's Got Talent, she became one of the fastest selling artists in all, of all time. Susan Boyle somehow managed to recreate herself and find her seat in musical glory. Well, Steve Jobs. He struggled with formal education and he dropped out of college. But he went on to be the co-founder of Apple Computers and was a leader in the personal computer revolution. His net wealth in 2010, a year before he died, was estimated to be $8.2 billion. That would make any church treasurer happy, wouldn't it? Jobs was a visionary, a man who looked to the future. And using ice hockey image, uh, imagery, Steve once remarked, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it has been. Now, I wonder if the Apostle Paul had ever heard of ice hockey. Probably not in a Mediterranean climate. And yet Paul wants us to skate to where the puck is going to be. The puck is moving towards heaven and so we should be skating towards heaven because that's what visionaries do. They skate to where the puck is going to be. Oh, we know where the puck's gone. Once we were held captive in this present evil age and we were dead to our sins. That's old news. Now skate to where the puck is going to be. And as we think about Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 this morning, we may even frame it like this. You be, you've become a Christian. You're no longer, you no longer belong to this world. The puck has moved. Life has changed. Now God has made you alive in Christ. Now you have the energy and the vision and the momentum and the will to skate to where the puck is going to be. So skate there. Skate towards Christ who is seated in heaven. Now this morning I'd like us to uh, uh, concentrate on verses 6 and 7 of Ephesians 2. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages God might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Raised up with Christ, seated with him, God's amazing kindness poured out to us in Christ Jesus. God saved us, he is saving us, and he will save us because we are in union with Christ. So look at where the puck is going to be and skate toward your heavenly home. Perhaps you noticed as uh, we read verses 6 and 7 that Christ is mentioned five times. Five times. For we do not understand the gospel unless we grasp our union in Christ, unless we understand our participation in him. Theologians talk about the language of participation, uh, which means, uh, and you'll see it on the screen there, the language of participation. We cannot, we cannot, <laughs> there we go, we cannot understand the life God gives us apart from the life God gives to Christ. You got that? We cannot understand the life God gives us apart from the life God gives to Christ. See, the whole of our Christian experience rests on our participation in Christ. Christ was raised and we were raised with him. 
Christ is seated alongside the Father and we are seated alongside him. We are made alive in Christ because we share in Christ's resurrection. We are in Christ. Christ's death applies to us. When we are in Christ, Christ's resurrection also applies to us. When we are in Christ, Christ's exaltation applies to us. And this is the language of participation. And it must be the most joyous teaching any sinner can receive because it is the ground of our salvation. And even our faith is a gift from God. Even our thought to believe and to trust in Jesus is given to us as a gift. And this gift of faith joins us to Christ. So we, is, we are his and he is ours. So we are saved because we participate in the life of Christ. Paul consistently uses the language of participation. Follow with me. You see in verse 5, God made us alive with Christ. See it there. Verse 6, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Three times in one verse, then verse 7. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And then verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Friends, this is basic, essential Christianity, but God in Christ, with Christ. Church is the people who have been saved through faith in Christ Jesus. Authentic Christianity is about Jesus and our participation in him. And so the church is no more or no less than those whom God has called and saved. Church is the people whom God has raised with Christ. Church is the people uh, who are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Uh, it seems that on the few occasions that Jeanette and I have been to Mount Bora to watch a parasailing competition, some poor pilot seems to crash and, and needs a rescue helicopter. There's something about parasailing, about parasailing that looks dangerous to me. I don't think I'd really want to do it. I don't know about you. Would you do it? But uh, to me, it's the horror of being suspended by this small sail in the, and caught in strong updrafts and downdrafts. It's just totally scary. This poor guy in the photo lost control shortly after takeoff. You can't see him, but he's in there somewhere, in the helicopter probably. Yeah, he may have died unless he was rescued by the experts who took their patient to the safety of hospital. Oh, the injured pilot uh, did nothing more than cooperate and participate in the rescue. He could not save himself. The only thing he could do was trust in those who could save him. For a short time, it was though the rescuer and the one um, being rescued were one. They were, they were joined, and this is the language of participation. But friends, it seems fashionable these days to say that I participate in Christ, that I am in union with him, but I need not participate in his church. That I can be a Christian without church. But did the son ever walk away from the Trinity and say, I don't need your fellowship? Did that ever happen? Did Jesus ever give up on his small church of 12 members? Did the apostle ever decide that church was too hard and it was not worth his time and effort? God saves individuals for life in his community. We are saved for church. And God raises us up to participate in his heavenly church and our earthly churches are little outposts of that great heavenly church which one day we will inherit. God made us alive in Christ to participate in him, to live in union with him, which is why the apostle says, it is no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. Can you say that? 
It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Participation, union in Christ. God raised us up with Christ, not before Christ, not after Christ, but as our passage says, with Christ. God raised us up with Christ. The resurrection of believers with Christ has taken place, Paul is saying here. Right now we share Christ's risen life in the heavenly realm, that we have been brought from the deepest hell into heaven itself. When we put our trust in Jesus, then we left behind the mindset of this world. Oh, once we were dead to God, dead in our trespasses and sins, and that is the terrible tragedy of every person who is not a Christian. They are dead in in trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy, then did something incredible in our lives. Now we are fundamentally different from who we once were. Our rising with Christ marks a radical new beginning. We've been raised from the dead to be given a totally new existence. Paul puts it this way in Romans 6.11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. Get your head around that. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive in Christ Jesus. God raised us to be alive with his son. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the Scottish uh, preacher and commentator, says that this is the biggest thing that you will ever know about yourself. And this is what it is. That you are alive unto God, he says, in tune with the eternal and have been awakened to something infinite and absolute. This is who you are. This is who God raised you to be. Through faith in Christ, God has raised you to be alive. You are no longer dead, but alive in Christ. It's incredible news. This is the gospel in all its glory. This is your position before God. So don't you go home today without praising God because you are alive in Christ, that God raised you up with Christ and privileged you with a seat at his right hand. The person raised up with Christ is walking in newness of life. That's what it means. You are raised up with Christ. The Christian has a new mind, which Paul describes in Romans 12 too. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, new minds look at the world in new ways. The old mind does not think beyond death, but the renewed mind is interested in eternity. The Christian life, or the Christian sees this life as a temporary life, like the change room before the main game. But the person raised with Christ knows that the Lord will come again and life will extend forever into the new creation. The person raised with Christ has totally new desires. The greatest desire is to no longer please self uh, with more pleasure and momentary satisfaction. It is a desire for righteousness. It is a desire for true holiness. The the renewed person says along with David, create within me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See, the greatest desire of a person raised with Christ is to be clean within, to be pure, to be holy, to be righteous, to have a heart to have a disposition, to to have a mind, to have a life free from sin. Oh, the person raised with Christ is interested in the Bible, in a way unlike before. The realisation dawns that this is the only book that brings one to God and an increasing participation in the life of his son. All we need to know for righteous living is within its pages. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting 
and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The person raised with Christ reads God's word for understanding and for growth and for maturity and for holiness. The person raised with Christ has a desire for prayer and fellowship with other Christians. Fancy that. 1 John 3, 14. Oh, we know that we have passed from death to life. And how do we know that? Because we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Well, how black and white is that? The family of God are the people we love and the people we long for. So why wouldn't we come to church? While the church building might be something we visit, the church family is our home. For all eternity, we will live in the presence of God's glorious, glor- gloriously redeemed people. And so you have been raised with Christ to a new life, with new desires, or with a new love for God's word, with a heart for prayer and a fellowship and a desire for fellowship with God's people. We are different in mind, we are different in will, we are different in spirit. So have you been raised? Have you been raised with Christ? Are you alive to God? Do you know God? Is your heart's desire to fellowship with him and his people? And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. We are raised with Christ and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms. Well, what's the difference between Christ's resurrection and his exaltation? Well, the resurrection proclaims he lives and he lives forever and the exaltation proclaims he reigns and he reigns forever. Christ lives, Christ rules, he is our risen, glorious king. Are you surprised that Paul refers to our resurrection and seating with Christ as already taken place? God raised us up with Christ, our passage says, and seated us with him. See, the past tense implies that this has already happened. Have a look at the verse yourself. Paul is saying you are already raised up with Christ and you are already seated with him. So what does Paul mean? What does Paul mean when he says raised up? Because aren't we still waiting for the resurrection? And without our resurrection, how can we be seated with Christ in the heavenly realms? So we have a a problem, a question in the text and we need to answer it because we need to understand really what God is doing in our lives. And friends, let me say that the Past tenses in verse 6 are the best our translators can do, but in the Greek the verbs are more nuanced than the simple English past tenses. That was a mouthful, wasn't it? So your your Bibles aren't wrong. The past tense is okay, but it just simply needs unpacking. That's what all that means. It just needs some explanation, and this is what I think we need to know is by way of explanation. From the perspective of God who is in heaven and who is beyond time and space, what God did for Christ, he did at the same time for all believers. So when God raised Christ, he raised us up. When God seated Christ alongside himself, we were seated alongside Christ. God looks at our whole salvation as a single and complete event. Paul writes this way because with this knowledge comes assurance. See, your salvation is finished through faith in Christ and therefore nothing can snatch you away. 
when on the cross, when the son cried out, it is finished. And these words then resonate through history because salvation really is finished. God has purposed and executed his plan of salvation and it is finished. Your faith in Christ confirms that you belong to God and that you are his for all eternity. So read verse 6 and those past tenses with thankfulness. Praise God for those two divinely inspired past tenses. I thought that I'd never get to say that in 25 years of ministry. Thank God for past tenses in our translations because they assure you in these verses that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Salvation has been accomplished. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword separate you from God? No, for in all these things we are more than conquerors. But the viewing of God's completed salvation from our human perspective is limited. We are bound by time and we think of event coming after event. And... Rather helpfully, the Bible also accommodates our limited point of view. So we are now living in these last days, and these days will end with the physical resurrection, which Paul uh, talks about in verses such as in 1 Corinthians 15. We see and experience in part that which has already been completed in his Son and by his Spirit. We are raised, but not yet raised. We are seated alongside Christ, but yet to be seated. It's an interesting concept. Can I flesh it out uh, with an imperfect illustration? When a politician wins an election, there is a period of time between the declaration by the electoral office and the swearing-in ceremony. We know that, don't we? We see that at, at, at every election. And even though the victory has been won, and even though the winner has been declared, the victor is for a short time physically separated from the fruit of his victory. So for a short time, we are separated from the entirety of our salvation, which already has been won for us. And so as we push forward in our Christian lives, we know it's not a futile exercise because God has gone before us. Oh, the Christian life is eclectic, filled with joy and filled at times with sorrow and, and grief and pain. But press on in Christ because he has conquered all and we are more than conquerors in him. And God in his generosity allows us now to experience in part the fullness of our salvation. Even now we get a glimpse of the glory before us. We have the Holy Spirit within us, the first fruits of our salvation. Even now we are enjoying something of our future life in the new creation. Even now in our Christian lives we see glimpses of the glory that awaits us. So, do what, so why do so many Christians live fruitless lives? Martin Lloyd-Jones says, it is because we never realise the depth of the pit out of which we have been brought by the grace of God that we do not thank God as we ought. And then there is our failure to realise the great heights to which he has raised us. You have been raised with Christ and you are seated with him in the heavenly realms there is nothing more to be done other than pressing on to take that which has already been won for you. So encourage one another. Press on, for your future is assured and the glory of the new creation awaits all those who are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that as we gaze upon the entirety of of salvation and as we see it as a completed work we thank you that in Christ that we participate in it even now father help us to skate to where the park is going to go not to meander but to be intentional about this 
Help us to deliberately live our Christian lives in a way that glorifies you. Father, take us back to your word because we are raised with Christ. Help us to pursue holiness because we are raised with Christ. Help us to pray because we have been raised with Christ. Help us to fellowship with one another because we have been raised with Christ. Help us to be mission-minded and care about the lost because we have been raised with Christ. And so, Father, we ask that you would do uh, this great work within us and help us to move forward to the honour of your name. Amen.